This is the Alhambra Investments Weekly Market Pulse. Joe Calhoun is here. And this week, we're going to talk about something I have heard over and over in the 30 years that I've been in this business, and that's buying the dip except for last week, because buying the dip was like throwing a dart at a car going past you at 100 miles an hour. What was, what was that all about, Joe? Well, you know, I think it just goes to show there's a lot of money looking to get in this market. I think a lot of things that are, that are going on right now are just a function of there's a ton of money out there. And everybody spent uh, the entire uh, time in lockdown. They didn't have any money. They couldn't spend money. Or if, or if they could, it was limited, I, I suppose. Uh, so, you know, they've got money and, uh, they see the market going up and they're chasing it. It's, uh, if you want to buy the dip, you better be quick. Well, this is, it seems to me that a lot of people are buying things just because they think they should be buying it, or they got a tip from their brother-in-law who heard something at the grocery store from a guy that got it from the barber. You know, they, <laughs> they're not taking the time to research this and really know what they're getting. Well, Bob, you, you can't take time to research things. You'll miss the move. <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, I, I think it's in a way it's humorous. And I, I kind of spent this week uh, writing, uh, adding a little humor to it this week because it's, it's a little frustrating out there if you're trying to buy this market or trying to make some investments for, for people. Market just runs away from you on the upside. But uh, listen, I think, as I said in the piece, I think there's a lot of people in our business that are not are not doing the, the proper research. You know, they're buying the biotech index or whatever, thinking that, you know, knowing what sector it is is enough. And of course, you know, as well as I do, if you dig into these things, a lot of these ETFs, even though they have the same name, can be very, very different. Uh, so, yeah, I listen, I think this is performance chasing. It's uh, things are going up. So I got to get in. Um, you know, they don't want to don't want to meet with the relatives at Thanksgiving and go, no, I didn't buy that. <laughs> They've got to be sure that they own some, too. So, uh, yeah, I, I think people buying for all the wrong reasons, I suppose. But uh, at this point, it hasn't mattered much. Well, prices are high no matter where you look. Uh, if you look hard enough, long enough, you'll find some things. But to uh, the, the average investor, to people who are watching us today, what are the things they should be looking at? What should they be researching so that they make some wise decisions? Well, I think, you know, a, a really simple thing to do is to look at uh, it's something like the, the price to earnings ratio based on expected earnings. Listen, there's lots of different ways to look at the market and valuations. Uh, people want to look, use the Schiller PE, which looks at the trailing average 10 years of, of earnings. But it's looking backwards. You really can't do that. The only thing you can do really is look at estimates. And, and look, those are going to be drastically wrong at turning points. And there's nothing you can do about that. But really, I think what you want to look at is look at that prospective PE and look at the expected growth rate of earnings. And look, if you can buy stocks with uh, an expected growth rate and a PE that's about the same, that's generally in history been a pretty good deal. The problem we have right now is that when you look at large cap stocks, the S&P 500 trades for uh, a PE that's a significant premium to the growth rate. Uh, that's not as true with mid cap and small cap. Mid cap and small cap stocks seem to be a little more reasonably priced, which by the way, I don't think most people would uh, expect that. People in our business who know what those things mean, I don't think most people would even know that. Uh, but you got to do the research. Um, Howard Silverblatt at S&P uh, puts out a spreadsheet that's got all these estimates and stuff embedded in it. Just Google Howard Silverblatt S&P uh, and you'll be able to find the spreadsheet and download it. It's free. Uh, it's, it's good information. It's easily available and anybody can do it. But in general, I think too that what you want to try to do is, you know, to put it this way, uh, I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Howard Marks, I think, said that you can't expect to have an extraordinary result doing what everybody else is doing. So if you're just doing the same things that everybody else is doing, you're buying large cap tech stocks, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing all the same things, you're going to get the same result. So what you want to do is you want to look for areas that have promise that other people don't like for some reason. Uh, it might be a regulatory issue. It might be uh, some company in a, in a, that is having problems uh, that you think are solvable, the, the market doesn't. Uh, that's, that's kind of our modus operandi when it comes to individual company stocks. We look for things with great brand names that are having some kind of problem that we think they can solve. Uh, a great example was, you know, close to a decade ago, we bought Sony. Nobody wanted Sony then. They thought the technology side was a mess. The, the entertainment side of the business was very volatile. Nobody wanted it. 
And we saw something there that we thought everybody was missing, uh, which, by the way, was something as simple as sensors for cam- cameras uh, that go in, and, and cell phones. So, yeah, Sony had a lousy cell phone business. They had a great business of providing those sensors to everybody else that makes cell phones. Uh, so you got to look for things. You got to do the research. You got to find those niches, those little areas where there's something that you know that everybody else is discounting or doesn't know. So uh, be a contrarian. Uh, you can't just be a contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. It's like, oh, well, everybody hates that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to like it. It's got to be something that everybody hates and you think there's a good reason to like it. Not just that it's out of favor, but that's really where you got to look. You're not going to find bargains if you're shopping in the same place everybody else is shopping. Uh, so, you know, be a bargain shopper. That's what I would say. Well, the point you made last week too, is that you don't have to be investing just because you think you should be investing. There's sometimes the hardest part and the most important part is waiting. Yeah. You know, I look, there's this idea that, oh, I don't want to sit in the bank and make 0.1%. And, you know, I get that. Obviously nobody wants to make nothing on their money. And in fact, look, if you're sitting in a bank account, a savings account, making 0.1, you're losing money the inflation rate's a heck of a lot higher than that. So you're losing purchasing power sitting in the bank. However, uh, losing a little purchasing power a couple of percent a year is vastly superior to losing 50% of your money because the stock market crashed. You got you, you to gotta have a balance in your life. You got to have some things that are safe. And you know what? Safe things are not going to make you much money. It's just the, this is the facts of life. Um, and I think, by the way, I think people don't understand that risk is, is inherent in everything that you do in the investing world. I talked a little bit about uh, mutual fund flows or, you know, flows actually into mutual funds and ETFs in the piece. And there is a big, big inflow to equities this year, bigger than we've seen in years. Because actually, for a long time, we've seen consistent outflows from, from equity funds. But you know what? the amount going into bond funds absolutely just swamps anything going into stocks. And I would tell you that, you know, the fact that everybody's buying bonds in a way that worries me every bit as much as everybody buying stocks. But there are things you can do. Uh, Nobody really wants to own real estate and we've done great with real estate this year. And, you know, most people don't want to own commodities, but you know what? They've been a great boon for us this year. You got to do the things that other people don't want to do. Um, so, you know, like I said, just, uh, you, you don't have to do anything. Sometimes it's best to just sit and watch. So it was a week ago today, we had the big fall off down a thousand points at one spot during the day, uh, over the next several days comes back up where, where we were maybe a little higher than that. So you got a quick fall off, a quick recovery. Has it really changed the big picture at all? Yeah, not really. Now, look, that's the other thing too, is concentrate on what's important. Look, you can look at every economic report that comes down the pike and you can always find something negative or positive about just about every one of them. But you know what? Uh, something like the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, it's a big broad-based indicator that's made up of a whole bunch of other indicators and they can, can uh, average them all together or however they, well, that's not exactly how they do it, but it doesn't matter. It's aggregated. It's a big broad-based indicator of how the economy is doing. And right now, uh, that index is at 0.06. That's the three-month moving average. What that means is that zero means you're growing at trend. Above zero means you're growing above trend. Below zero means you're growing below trend. And at some point, you get far enough negative, it means you're contracting. That's usually quite a bit lower, or minus 0.75, something like that. So right now, it's just slightly above trend. What's trend? Well, coming into this, we were at 2.2% growth before covid Uh, I don't think they've changed that number. So, you know, look, the economy has slowed exactly as we expected it to. But the point is that that gives you, that tells you, look, you can talk about a slowdown and that's fine. It's slowed down. It doesn't mean you're going into a recession. It doesn't mean that you need to sell everything. Uh, It doesn't mean you need to buy 30-year bonds. What it means is that the economy has slowed back to trend. And I don't think that should be surprising. Um, Same thing with, like I said, big, broad-based indicators. Uh, that's an example of one. Uh, I'm trying to think of another one, but uh, it, it, you know, think about what's important. I will give you a, another example of something I think is extremely important, uh, which doesn't get much attention. Real interest rates. Take a look at tips. In fact, the 10-year tips yield this morning hit an all-time low, minus 1.12%. What does that tell you? I think it tells you two things. Number one, real growth is not going to be that great. We already know that. CFNAI uh, the Chicago Fed National Activity Index confirms that. So there's 
two things that confirm each other. The other thing it means is people are really afraid of inflation. They're buying tips with a guarantee of losing purchasing power, and they're continuing to do it at record low yields because they're so afraid of inflation, they'll accept a negative 1.12% return, real return, just to protect them from something even worse. That, that's, that's a stunning statement if you think about that. Uh, so look, I don't know if we're going to have inflation like that. I don't think we will, uh, but I don't know. And, uh, in some ways it may be people's behavior that causes it. Their fear of it can, can actually cause the problem. You know, that's a good point too. Uh, I, I in the first part of the essay uh, this week, I, I used some, some economic stats and I kind of tongue in cheek said, oh, well, the market went up because, you know, building permits went down, <laughs> you know, and to kind of use some all some negative economic stats and, and said, oh, the market went up on that. Look, if you're looking at the, the economic statistics that are being released today and you're trying to figure out what the economy is going to do, you're doing this back, or excuse me, you're trying to figure out what the market is going to do, you're doing this backwards. You got to look at what the market's doing today to figure out what the economic stats are going to be tomorrow. That's how we figured out there was going to be an economic slowdown that now shows up in the economic stats because we were watching the market. The market interest rates started to fall months ago. We knew that something was happening. We knew that the economy was slowing down. We didn't have to wait for the stats to find out if we were right. Ultimately, the stats come out and prove you right. But again, you, you got to think ahead. The market looks ahead. Economic stats being released are looking backwards. It does you no good whatsoever. So um, I don't know. That, that, that's a long way of saying Pay attention to the details and, and pay attention to the big, broad things. Nothing much has changed. The dollar didn't move last week. Interest rates were, were kind of wild, but in the end, the 10-year Treasury note moved two basis points. As You can sneeze and make it move two basis points. It doesn't mean anything. So don't get too caught up in all this stuff. Most of it doesn't mean anything anyway. 